So I went to a debate. It was a Christian Muslim debate. And the pastor was like, you know, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God. So I, I waited till after the lecture. I went up to him. I said, listen, can I ask you a few questions? So he says, sure, my son, ask me. In the Bible, Jesus is on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why has that forsaken me? These are my two questions. Jesus, you said he's God. He said, yes. I said, you said he's the son of God. He said, yes. Who is he calling upon? He says, my God, my God. So what I'm seeing here, I got your God, Jesus, and I got the God of Jesus. So how do I understand all of that? He put his hand on my shoulder. He says, son, you just have to have faith. I looked at him, I was like, shh. I said, that was the worst thing to tell me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi Welcome, brother. Mashallah, Jazakallah khair for having us. Good to meet you. Same here, man. What's your name and where are you from? So I am your brother, Imam Wesley LeBron, originally from Puerto Rico, but I'm born and reside in New Jersey, alhamdulillah. So what was your experience like growing up? So alhamdulillah, I come from a very culturally Puerto Rican family. So growing up, naturally, it was all about family. My grandparents were like the first immigrants from Puerto Rico to the States. And uh, my father came when he was in his teens. So by the time my father got married, he had me. He was quite young. Family was very super, super close knit. So I grew up with all my cousins and family, always hanging out. There was always events. My house was actually like the chill spot. Mm -hmm. So whenever Christmas came around, everybody was in my house. New Year's came around, everybody was in my house. I always say somebody passed when we threw a party in my house. <laughs> it was just like that in my house. It was always, mashallah, people in the house, family coming through. You know what I mean? I was raised with all my cousins, man. So, you know, it was very family orientated. I mean, I come from a Christian family, mm. uh, Pentecostal. My parents weren't so religious. They were young when they had me again. So my father and my mother still were kind of into the party life and, you know, getting the good things of life, the material mm -hmm. world, having the house, having the car, you know, my father used to work two, three jobs so that we could have those things. And his mentality was, I'm going to give my kids what my parents were never able to give me. And kind of the same thing he told me when I started having kids, what I couldn't do for you, you make sure you do it for your children. But then with that came my grandmother, who was like the religious figure of the household. For us, my generation anyway, uh, Puerto Ricans, the grandparents played a big role in upbringing and raising the kids. And that was my cousins were the same way, mashallah. So I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, specifically from my father's side, uh, because she got divorced from my grandfather after some time. So I spent a lot of time with her while my parents went out to the club. They was dropping me off by grandma. She became the person who I would learn my morals and my etiquettes from religious behavior from. I learned to speak Spanish and read in Spanish, not only speaking at home, but also reading the Bible in the Spanish language before I would go to bed. She would open up a couple of verses here, read, and we'll go through it together. And then my father's sister, who also was very religious, she's older than my dad, then she would take us to church on Sundays. So this was kind of the process growing up. You know, we had a very religious family, a very close knit family. It was both religious and free flowing. <laughs> so we have both sides, you know, inshallah. So I grew up seeing both sides and I grew up experiencing both sides of those coins. So even though your parents wasn't so religious, did you believe in God? So naturally coming up as a young man, I say we believed in what we were taught to believe in. It wasn't anything of, I have this belief system because I go to church and I really listen to the pastor and I'm paying attention and I, and I want to be a believer, right? I speak truth. We was forced to go to Sunday school, right? And it would be me and all my cousins. But we looked at it as a chill point okay, we're going to go to church, we're going to chill. You know what I mean? We're together, we chill. And, and then when we got older, yo, we're going to go to church. You know, the girls are at church. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? So, we go to church because of the girls, right? SubhanAllah. But they would instill different values in us, you know what I mean, as those things were happening. You know, my grandmother was very keen on saying, uh, you know, no se ha impio, right? It's, it's like, a, like almost like a slang in our uh, culture, where basically like, don't be unrighteous. Don't be like your parents, she used to say, you know, all of that drinking and that party and, you know, I mean, that's the devil's work. Don't be involved in that stuff. So she tried to bring me up uh, that way. We lived in the hood. So, you know, Friday night across the street from grandma's house, it was like three bars. By the time 12 o'clock kicked off, they out there fighting, you know, that was our movie theater. We opened the screens up. <laughs> <laughs> we watching out the window, what's going on. And then she used those as teaching moments and lessons and stuff like that. But because we had the other side of the coin where my parents weren't so religious, my parents didn't go to church at all, right? My father, he really doesn't go to church. He believes that there's a God. He kind of says religion is is a place where people just battle it out and got all these ideas. I don't got time for it. You know what I mean? I believe there's God. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to live right. I'm going to leave it there. And then my mother, she wasn't religious either. She became religious 
later on in life. But then because there was that aspect of partying and drinking all the time, so we grew up naturally wanting to do those things as well. I was the young buck, right? So I'm like the youngest cousin. Uh, so all of my cousins, they were two, three, four years older than me. So because of that, you know, I'm eight, they're 12, I'm 10, they're 14, right? So they have experiences that I had not yet had, but now I'm getting them because of them, Yeah. right? So the Budweiser was in the fridge. Everybody's busy drinking. Yo, who's going to go snatch a Budweiser out the fridge, take it up to the room so we could drink? And then we begin to taste alcohol this way, right? And begin to drink like this and experience what these different things are like. So I, I, I say I wasn't really faithful because I had those two lives in my face. This one seemed pleasurable and enjoyable, right? Everybody's here having fun. Over here, it's kind of like, okay, you go to church, we sing. Everybody seems to get emotional and spiritual about it. Oh, good but okay what's the big deal so i don't i didn't see myself as very spiritual or religious at that point in life how did you first hear about islam and what attracted you to it my parents got divorced when i was 10. Mm -hmm. my father he called the house it's like I, i'll never forget this day he told my mother to speak with me and said uh you know son me and your mother having problems i'm not coming back home and that caused a lot of trauma in my life that i didn't know about subhanallah until maybe like seven years ago you know i'm 47 now i was about 40 38 40 then when we i was doing an interview like this and i talked about this moment in my life and i broke down crying like a baby and subhanallah i couldn't finish the interview i had to walk away and then brother said man you got some undealt with trauma in your life i love my dad dearly i was very close to him and those years that i went to live with my my dad, because I come from a broken home, I was able to manipulate my parents because my parents didn't talk to one another. So naturally, sometimes I'll be like, yo, I'm going to mom's house. Mom, I ain't coming over this weekend. I'm going to my boys be traveling, it's going somewhere, right? So I got into a lot of trouble, man. From seventh grade to about my junior year in high school, I got into so much trouble based off of just because of alcohol, drugs, weed, selling it, all of these different things, subhanAllah. And all of those struggles, basically were what caused me when I was around 1920 to begin to look for something. By that point, I almost died like twice, I, drinking and driving. I crashed my car two times, uh, fell asleep behind the wheel, almost killed myself. Um, the second time I was in, in a diner and some dudes said something to my cousins and my cousin got up and he began to fight with them. I got up, I started to fight, got hit with a catcher bottle, the Heinz glass joint, the hard joint, got hit this side, coffee cup on this side. Doctor was like, little centimeter over, you'd have been done. You know what I mean? I had a charge, threat with attempted murder when I was 18, 19. Alhamdulillah, Allah allowed me to come out of it and found me not guilty. So these things were like a trajectory in my life where I start saying like, man, what am, what am I doing with my life? I dropped out of school by the time I was in 11th grade. I'm talking about freshman year. 11th grade, the first year. I went to school maybe a month and a half. I came home to my dad. I was like, yo, I don't want to go to school no more. My father was like, what you mean? I'm like, I'm done. I'm done with school. I'm done with all of that. I was considered a freshman at that point. I hadn't done no work. My mother was like, nah, you got, you got to go to school. You can't. My, I was like, look, I said, y'all either take me out or I just, I'm never going to go back. The truant officer is going to come and you're going to have issues. My father said, no, I'm going to sign you out. But he found me a job the next day. I was working 60 hours that week. Now you're going to be a man. He actually took me out of the apartment where we was living at. He had a house. He made me a room in the basement, bathroom, kitchen, bedroom. He says, now that's your spot. Give me my key. <laughs> Don't come take stuff out my refrigerator no more. You got to go buy your own stuff. You got to take care of yourself. So I start realizing what manhood was about. And then I got hit with the biggie. I got a girl pregnant. Now I'm 18 with a kid on the way. Eight, nine months later, I got another girl pregnant. Now I got two different women, two kids on the way. I ain't got no education. I'm a dropout. I'm working odd jobs and I'm selling drugs to try to make up ends meet on top of that. And it was in this moment, my mother used to raise foster children. One of the kids, uh, his name was Edgar. I used to call him Green Eyes. Uh, his mother died of HIV. His father was in prison most of his life. So I caught feelings for the young brother. Like, like if he was my little brother, we start hanging out. He said he was part of Zulu Nation. By that point, I had got my GED again, taking computer electronic technician, going to like uh, one of these uh, one year schools just to get a trade. And then I started going back to college and I was studying political science at the time. Um, so when he told me about Zulu, Everybody knows Zulu through hip hop, but then I got to see the other side. I got to see the gang side. Africa Bambada, he would have meetings on 125th in Harlem, an African art museum up on the second floor. We'd go there, leave your weapons at the door, then you go inside. And at that meeting, uh, you know, it, it kind of pulled me, one, because I was studying political science. And then, you know, it was just interesting, the different things he used to talk about. So I, it kind of pulled me in that way. After like a month, two months, a brother came out of prison, Abdul Aziz, and he had accepted Islam and 
prison in, in Rikers. He's Puerto Rican. He gave a talk that day on Islam, homosexuality, and Tawheed. We took him home that day. He lived in the Bronx. He gave me my first book, Kitab Tawheed by Dr. Bilal Phillips, and then our first Quran. And then, mashallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, the journey began at that point and really looking more deeply into faith. So Islam came right in that integral part in my life where everything was falling apart and collapsing. Tell me the moment when you realized Islam was the truth. I used to work for a lighting company and uh, it was very specific. We used to make uh, the lights that they use in the military. We see the searchlights, we used to make those lights. So they're very specific. We only made two, three a week. So I was able to set up almost a month of work within like three days. The boss didn't care, I was chill. So I was able to just read. So I started reading the Bible, marking it up, man. And I'm just finding this stuff verse after verse after this and that. And I'm like, yo, we doing all type of stuff in Christianity backwards. So in the process of that, especially going through the New Testament, I came to the point where I'm finding Jesus never said he was God. They called him the prophet. He didn't deny it. He's prostrating on the ground, praying to God. He's saying, don't call me good. The only one good is that one in heaven. You know what I mean? He's saying, don't call no one father on earth. The only one that only fathers that one in heaven. Basically, the father is better than I. He's greater than I. Come on the day of judgment. You're going to say, my Lord, my Lord. He's going to say, get away from me, you wicked people, for you have not done what that father has commanded you. And then I got to the point where he was on the cross. And on the cross, I read the verse, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That joy jammed me. So I went to a debate. It was a Christian Muslim debate. And the pastor was like, you know, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is God. So I, I waited to after the lecture. I went up to him. I said, listen, can I ask you a few questions? I said, I'm battling faith right now. I'm like stuck. And if you could solve this problem for me, it would help me in this journey. So he says, sure, my son, ask me. So I said, in the Bible, Jesus is on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why has that forsaken me? These are my two questions. Jesus, you said he's God. He said, yes. I said, you said he's the son of God. He said, yes. I said, who is he calling upon? He says, my God, my God. So what I'm seeing here, I got your God, Jesus, and I got the God of Jesus because Jesus is calling on a God. And then he said, why has thou forsaken me? You told me Jesus knew his purpose. He came to die for our sins. So why is he saying now in the critical moment, right? Because that's when faith comes to the front, right? In the critical moment, when you're supposed to show up with faith, this is when you show up with it. Now you're going to say, why has thou forsaken me? And this is the message we got, right? So I said, if he didn't, if he's saying that, he didn't know his purpose because the purpose was to come die for us. He shouldn't be forsaken. And who forsaked him? If he's God, did he forsake himself? Did he forget his own mission? Did he forget his own cause? I saw, I said, you see my, my, my problem? I said, so how do I understand all of that? He put his hand on my shoulder. He said, son, you just have to have faith. I looked at him, I was like, shh. I said, that was the worst thing to tell me. So it was the worst thing to tell me, man. I said, uh, you should have direct. I was hoping you was going to direct me back to the Bible, back to some verses. I said, but you did help me. You pushed me to where I need to go, right? Which was the direction I was aiming at anyway, because part of our process of finding the truth was looking at all of the religions and seeing if the religion worshipped a thing, a constellation, star, moon, an animal, a human being, it got chucked and put into the garbage. Why? Because we shouldn't be praying to those things. Right. So the only religion I found was Islam that said, pray to the creator of the heavens and earth, the one who created all of those things. So after that, we went back to Abdul Aziz and Abdul Aziz, you know, he came, he's like, yo, y'all ready? You want to take Shahada? I told him, I said, I'm ready. I said, but the only way I'm taking Shahada is if you're not going to tell me what to do, how to do it and when to do it. I believe in Allah, Muhammad, I don't know him too well, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But obviously if he came with this book, this book is amazing. Right. Especially scientifically, it's stuff. There's no way he could have no. So he got to be someone sent by God. I'll get to know him eventually. I accept him. I'll get to know him eventually. I can't say I love him. I, I'll get to know him eventually. Abdul Aziz was like, yo, not a problem. So we took Shahada based on that. Alhamdulillah. And that's kind of what drove me to that point to become Muslim, mashallah. So when you took your Shahada, how was that feeling? Funny enough, there was no feeling, man. <laughs> you know, you, you, I always hear these Shahada stories, mashallah, and they're like, yo, I, I saw in a dream the Prophet, right? And so Allah Sallam and the Prophet, mashallah, he spoke to me and it guided me. You know, I, I felt something that day. Bro, I was in the Bronx, in the projects, outside on the street corner, smelling weed, <laughs> right? And just took the Shahada, man. I didn't have no expectations from the Aziz. I didn't have no expectations from the Muslims because I really didn't even know who the Muslims were. Right I, Up to that point, I hadn't even been inside of a masjid. My feelings were normal. It's like, okay, I, I accepted something in my life and we're going to see where it goes. But I'm also thankful that I took my shahada that way because unfortunately nowadays, 
we give people or we create that feeling for people. We just had a conference in New York. We had about 350, 400 people. And a brother came, we brought him up in front of 400 people, take Shahada, you know, the brothers is like, ah. if brothers like being in the concert, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love like what, bro? That's a problem, bro. The brother felt good. It's, it's, and you know, we want to make people feel good, yeah, yeah. right? But not at the expense of that feeling only comes at that moment. For me, I said, you know, because I, I took my shot in the street, I knew I had to depend on me. I wanted to go learn how to pray. I struggled. I got me a little book. I'm writing things down. I got papers all over the place. I'm trying to figure it out, trying to make it happen. And I believe that helped me to get to the point where I am now. How did your family and friends react to your conversion? So my family, it was, it was diverse. My father, he was just like, if it's something that's going to change your life for the positive, I support it. And he began to see some of the changes. But my mom, she kicked me out the house. When I accepted Islam, she started going to the church. And we banged heads when it came to that. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, man, after being Muslim for 20 years, she accepted Islam, alhamdulillah. Just recently, man, even more beautiful, man, alhamdulillah, three weeks ago, alhamdulillah, I was able to make Umrah with my mother, man. So going around the Kaaba with my mom, making Umrah, this was just like a dream. Do I answered. It was super emotional, mashallah, tabarak wa ta'ala. May Allah accept uh, the Umrah with your mother. Amen, amen, ya Rabbi, amen. Amen. So after your shahada, how did your pursuit of knowledge come about? So after the shahada, man, one of the things we realized right away was that knowledge is important. That when you walked into the masjid, everything was in Arabic or everything was in Urdu. English was done by some dude in the back of the masjid translating for a few brothers, converts, reverts, or some people that may have not understood the language from among maybe the youth. And I remember sitting there with the brother and he's translating the Sheikh's lecture. Like he would get lost, he got like he got lost in the, in, the, in the lecture and forgot to translate. And at that point I realized like, we gotta depend on these dudes to learn our faith. And I don't want to be like I was when I was Christian, that we just went to the church, whatever the pastor said, that was it. And I want to be able to, if people tell me I got to do something, that I know why I got to do it. I'm not just going to take stuff on face value. So at that point, alhamdulillah, I dug into an African-American masjid that I had ended up getting introduced to. It was my masjid for about 10 years and they were heavy into education. So they, mashallah, came in and right away they would, there was conferences going on, there's lectures going on. Mashallah, I was a, a, a tape collector. I know the, the, the young men and women, they hear tapes, they were like, yo, what's that, right? <laughs> They're not from that generation, mashallah. And I was just a tape collector. And because I, I used to, at that time, I worked for myself. I used to drive, doing rush work. So I had a lot of time in my car. So it was just listening to stuff all the time. And going to the imam, driving him crazy. Like, your sheikh sent me overseas. And they just be like, be patient, be patient, be patient. So in 1999, it was actually in 2000, the University of Medina, they had a session in, in Virginia. And Virginia used to have the Islamic uh, University in Virginia. This is pre-9-11. After 9-11, it got shut down. So you used to be able to go to Virginia and Fairfax. and used to be able to learn Arabic and do Islamic studies right there on site. And then they would have sheikhs coming from Saudi Arabia and from different parts of the world, and they would be the instructors there. So they had like an intensive over the summer program on all of the basics of Islam, basic Arabic, basic fiqh, basic, you know, aqidah and stuff like that. So I went, it was like a four week, five week course. And so I took the course. I did well in the course. And part of the course was that at the end, you would take, uh, you would do an interview with the teachers from the University of Medina and the staff. And then based on the interview, you may get accepted and you may not get accepted into the different universities. They interviewed you for uh, for Muhammad ibn Saud, that was in Riyadh, and the University of Medina. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I got interviewed. And all I remember was, as I'm being interviewed, because I didn't know Arabic, of course, at the time, um, they would, kept asking me where I'm from. So I was like, Puerto Rico. All I kept hearing was Puerto Rico, right? This is the only thing I was, Puerto Rico, right? I'm like, oh, it's got to be good, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, about seven, eight months later after that, my boy calls me from Riyadh. He was studying in Riyadh. And he's like, yo, you got accepted to Muhammad ibn Saud. Your name is on the list. Then my boy calls me from Medina. He's like, yo, you got accepted to Medina. Your name is on the list. So he's like, yo, what you going to do? And I was like, ah, oh, man, now what do I choose? The Riyadh was very tempting because they took care of the students, but it didn't have the automatic pass passageway from Arabic into the to the university you had to apply University of Medina was kind of you got that right of passage right away to go and do you know your two years of Arabic four years in, in, in the university so I said I'm gonna go to Medina alhamdulillah and then in 2000 August of 2001 I landed in Medina right before 9-11 happened you mind telling us a story about Medina so Medina for me I tell people it wasn't an educational journey for me 
Alhamdulillah, I came to Medina, I already knew some Arabic. I got the same teacher my boy had, so I already knew the system. He was already training me in the system. So I came in, I already knew the vocab, I knew some of the grammar. So it was more like a review for me that first semester because I was only there for six, seven months. But 9-11 happened. I got two kids, you know, my kids was two and three. Uh, my wife, she's living with her in-laws and my in-laws, they didn't like Islam very much. I took their daughter from being Catholic. She Muslim now. They're not happy about that. You know, everybody's in her ear. I'm not around. I'm like, am I going to go back home to a wife? <laughs> you know I mean, I'm not going back home to a wife. So I, I went to the office, man, and I told the office, I said, listen, man, I got a dilemma, man. I, I'm really concerned as a new Muslim, as a Latino, Hispanic Muslim, that ain't many of us. I'm going to have issues with my family because my family, I left them when I'm Muslims. So I was like, number one, can I bring my family? I just, I'll go back home. I'll pay everything just to bring my family here. I said, plus my wife is a teacher. She's an instructor. ESL is her thing. She learns the language. This is good for the Dawah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to sell them. And they were like, no. I ended up coming home, turning down the, the scholarship. And, and alhamdulillah, Allah made another way for me, though. Could you tell us a little bit about the Revert Connect? So, yeah, so alhamdulillah, Mass New York Reverts Reconnect is a program near and dear to my heart. MashaAllah, we've been now in the program or the program has been established now for about three solid years. I've been doing Revert work, man, since I accepted Islam. I ended up on the board of the masjid very early on. I've been a part of boards of masjids since then in the last 25 years and working with Reverts, you know what I mean, closely. So this was something that was always near and dear to my heart, especially uh, working uh, with Reverts in the Spanish language, which I did for a few years for another organization. So Mass, they approached me. And they told told me, look, man, we want to do some work for the reverts. We see that, you know, everybody's saying there's no aftercare, no this, no that. I got a, a lot of sour moments dealing with big organizations, Islamic organizations, unfortunately, masjids, humanitarian organizations, and the like. And because of those sour moments, when I sat with Mass, I was like, look, I'm not interested. They were like, look, come on, work with us, you know, give us the time, the day. We think we can do something good together. So I said, okay, Bismillah. My wife said, go for it, do it. I said, all right, I gave them conditions. Give me, don't give me a lot of red tape. I'm not the type of dude. I just, I walk away from stuff. I'm, I'm like that in my life. I just walk away. At the time, you know, I had a construction business. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I was doing construction, was making good money. I was GC, you know what I mean? I was okay financially. So I told them, like, like, I don't need the message money. You know what I'm saying? I told them, these are my conditions. They accepted the conditions. Alhamdulillah. Um, in the beginning, I kind of held back. I didn't want to give too much. But then, Alhamdulillah, I started to see that they were actually genuine and sincere. They wanted to do something for the reverts. So, mashallah, what we built out was a, a complete system after the person takes the shahada to make sure that that person does have family, to make sure that that person does have someone to care for them, take care of them. I had that experience. I didn't have that negative experience where I came to the mission and people walked away from me. I had the experience where the imam came, he sat down with us, he used to teach us every Wednesday. He barely could talk English, but he taught us every Wednesday. He taught, he sat us with his brother to teach us how to learn the Arabic alphabet. He taught us with the brother to sit down and learn how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So that was my experience. So because of that experience I had, I wanted to give that back to my brothers and sisters. Um, so we ended up, mashallah, doing a lot of fundraising. Uh, for the department uh, in Mass, Muslim American Society in New York. And we raised enough funds to, mashallah, staff some people, bring in volunteers. And now the program is fully up and running. We have about seven classes a week. Um, one of the things that we try to do is tell, I tell people our strength, our magic power is online because there's so many people um, that are disconnected. Just recently, we got a sister, I think, from Australia. Another sister from like Arkansas in the middle of the Arkansas, nowhere, no mesh near her. And so we got people like this that contact us like, yo, nearest mesh to me is two hours. So they don't have a source that they can go to every day. Maybe they'll go to Juma, but that's it. So online, we have about seven classes a week. We have, you know, a couple of, a couple of imams that are teaching with us as well. So we split up those duties between us uh, on what we're going to teach. We teach 12 week uh, semester based courses, just like a university. So we may take a subject, Akida, it may be, you know, Tefsir, whatever it may be. And we'll teach it for 12 weeks, inshallah ta'ala. Just recently, now we've converted that to now being a certificate program for those who want a certificate and now we'll give them actually not so much immersed like college but alhamdulillah you're going to have some activities that you're going to have to do throughout the semester inshallah ta'ala some assignments you do those assignments submit them at the end we'll give you a certificate certification saying you've taken this course with us for 12 weeks alhamdulillah mass you know it's logo on it our signature alhamdulillah you've completed this course our stable program has been our quran morning reading uh, program uh, we established the sister called me man like two and a half years ago and she's like imam like we need to read the Quran more. The sisters in Puerto Rico. And she's like, I, I got a group with the sisters and we do this every day. And it's it's amazing. So I told her, I said, listen, it's your idea. You tell me how we got how we gotta put it together. You know what I mean? And she basically gave me the you know, gave me the ins and outs, you know, we're gonna go ahead and make a group, get some readers, and then we can split up, you know, we can just maybe take a couple of pages and just read a couple of pages. So we started that, we just read a couple of pages a day. 
and even initially it was made mostly myself reading right and everybody else kind of just listening and then kind of people as we did it with more consistency consistency is the key for everything that now people's like oh i want to read and now hamila there's a sister she's in charge of it she handles the reading every single day i don't i don't oversee any of it and now we read a juice a day so in the last two and a half three years this Sunday, right before Ramadan, we finished our 28th complete reading of the Quran, the English translation. And then for Ramadan, we'll start all over again for the 29th, inshallah ta'ala. So every time we finish, we just kind of go back to the beginning again. And we set up in a way where we read a juz every day, but and then we set up time where we can have 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on how fast the readers are. Because sometimes you got some very slow readers, then you got some very fast readers. So the time limit, it changes every day. Um, to just reflect and ponder, you know, and say, okay, how did you feel? Did the verse touch you? And how many people just open up, man? And is this, we call it a safe space. I, I, I remind everybody, this is a space where you can talk about anything. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to judge you as an imam. I'm not going to let nobody else in this space judge you. You come to this space and be like, yo, I'm a sinner. I killed 99 people. No problem. I'm like, the doc, you know, you come to the doctor for the medicine, all right? You come to the hospital to get cured. You know what I mean? The last thing we want to do is push you away. So alhamdulillah, um, you know, we've been able to, mashallah, build that system like that where now people feel comfortable enough to talk and to express and to say how they're feeling, alhamdulillah. And then alongside with that, we ran, we actually uh, used to, uh, right before that session, we actually we went through the whole 10 volumes of Tafsir Sa'di. We read that together. Alhamdulillah, we did the two volumes of Riyadh Salihin. We read that together, mashallah, tabarak wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, and more for recognition based. And then part of the program is that we make sure that we have events that take place on site as well. So we have seven centers in New York City. We may do something in Brooklyn. We may do something in Queens. We may just set up a day. I rent the boat four times a year in the summertime for 60 people. And we just go out fishing. And we just go hang out together, mashallah, doing something halal, mashallah. And everybody has fun. We'll have a family day where the women can come with the children and the men. We have a day just for brothers. Brothers, you know what I mean? Sisters, the Sisters Day is coming, inshallah ta'ala, because they've been getting on me like, yo, we don't got the only Sisters Day, right? MashaAllah, tabarakallah. We'll have picnics. We make sure for Eid. We're having Eid celebrations where we're going to get together for Eid, Adha, and Fitr. MashaAllah. Part of that was the Umrah program. This was key for me because I used to take my, my, my students in 12th grade uh, when I was teaching 11th, 12th grade. I used to take them on Umrah and I saw how that helps to transform and, and how it helped me, right? So I told the organization, look, we got to figure out a system on how we can take new Muslims on Umrah and we may have to pay for some of them. We may have to pay partially because sometimes people just don't got the financial capability to do it. So last year was the first year we did it. Last year we took 45 people. We partially sponsored last year, maybe up to like 10, 50, 12, 10, 12 people. And then this year we took 50 people, mashallah, tabarakah wa ta'ala. And then this year we collaborated with my other organization, the three Puerto Rican Imams that I'm a part of. Alhamdulillah, so the three Puerto Rican Imams, we got a relationship with Launch Good. So I was at a dinner with the founder and some people from Launch Good, mashallah, and some other people who fundraised through the Launch Good campaign in New York and you know the founder told me he said listen we have a special program how we can maybe help you with the reverts to get them to go on Umrah so he told me about the program whatever have you so I was like alright cool mashallah um, so we did that so in partnering with Launch Good what, they, what Launch Good did for us was every time we collected 2,000 Launch Good gave us 2,000 as part of a donor system that they have these donors entrust Launch Good with this money on Fridays and this part of Friday giveaway and then Launch Good dedicates that money to causes that they feel are worthy right so they said you know mashallah the, found, the, co the founder there is, he's a convert, right, mashallah. So he's like, this is a worthy project. Um, so alhamdulillah, we were able to raise money to take 16 converts, 16 reverts, completely free this year. Mashallah. Alhamdulillah, through the three Puerto Rican Imams, mashallah, in collaboration with Mass New York, alhamdulillah. So that collaboration worked perfectly, alhamdulillah. Three Puerto Rican Imams, they got busy raising the money. Mass, we focused on all of the ins and outs and the details. And then Mass, you know, we, we sent some people through Mass as well. So this year made 100 people, because last year was 50 total, but 45 were reverts. And then we have 50 that were non-reverts with us, inshallah ta'ala. And it was an amazing experience, man, mashallah. And then we make sure that it's just not Umrah, right? Because yes, we take them to, you know, that, that immersion of just being at the Prophet's Masjid and, and the Kaaba is, mashallah, life-changing. Like, if I show you the video, man, these brothers and sisters, as soon as they saw the Kaaba, man, I, I just turn around, and it's just, they just bawling. They just bawl, crying, and it's just coming out of them. You know what I'm saying? SubhanAllah. But also, as part of the immersion and the experience, we take them out quads, out in the desert. I think the sisters were, were, went buck wild. <laughs> More than the men, it was out riding the quads, mashallah. Camel riding, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. We go get a little place in the desert. We go have a nice dinner, come out, have dinner together. We actually this year added, uh, we did Ijazah with the sisters of 40 Hadith Ijazah. So myself and Sheikh Yusuf Rios, we, mashallah, we have Ijazah and 40 Hadith. So we sat down with, you know, about 25 sisters and I mean, I would give them Ijazah and the 40 Hadith, mashallah, out there in the desert, mashallah, in Medina, alhamdulillah. So it becomes a really a, a dope experience, mashallah, of worship and camaraderie and brotherhood and sisterhood. And then when we come back, you know, they're all in the Umrah group together. 
and these brothers and sisters from last year we merged both groups these brothers and sisters are constantly contacting each other you know even this year one sister for our conference came down from dc connected with this is from new york stood with her mashallah so you build that muhajirun and sard uh brotherhood that existed and sisterhood that existed mashallah and then there's a lot of other things that are happening uh one of the things we we try to do is partner up with the mishka university um inshallah ta'ala where we if we find somebody that mashallah we see is serious about knowledge that we help to pay for their education so that you can get a degree in islamic studies but in that same time give back to the organization so we have some leaders in training so we can help build more people like us right we need more people like us that can go out study come back get on the ground and work inshallah ta'ala so one of the biggest things is just really building this team of individuals around us and just having consistency i remember when there was five people in the class online and just now the fiqh ramadan class that we've been doing the past couple of weeks mashallah we have 50 consistent online and that class a few of those classes went up to 90 95 people mashallah i remember when it was three of us in the quran program now there's 30 every single morning in the quran program and i tell many of the massages i say you tell me, do you get 30 people in, your, in, 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 in all of your classes consistent? No. We're getting it consistently, alhamdulillah. And it's not only the reverts, but it's like, as well, the born Muslims. I was at college yesterday, and you know, young girl, she's like, born Muslim, I have the revert experience, I don't even know how to pray. I'm 20 years old, don't know how to pray. So you know what? We take them in as well, alhamdulillah, and deal with them as well, mashallah. So we have reverts, we have born Muslims, you know what I mean, mashallah. We have a nice mix of people, mashallah. The sisters, mashallah, they have their own little session on Tuesday nights as well. Uh, that session, I think, got up to like 21 sisters now, mashallah. And, um, you know, mashallah, my wife is one of the ones that runs that session. And it started out with just like an hour, them getting together, reading some Quran. They go through some books, like right now they're going through Thilatha to Usul together, and then they kind of just kick it, you know what I mean, afterwards. And mashallah, they're enjoying themselves, they're having a good time, right? So mashallah is really providing what the reverts are looking for. And we're, we're looking to partner up and collaborate with other masajids, man, to be able to put this program everywhere. What I've seen is that the program has opened up a lot of eyes, so there's a lot of people asking about it now. So now it's just, let us get together, let us sit down, figure out how it can work. Because I tell people all the time, we can educate them. We got the online experience, but we can't give them the love that they need on site. Because if they're in another state, we can't get together with them. So that's where those brothers and sisters in that match should come in to kind of set those things up and we can help out on the educational side and then just make that synergy, man, that perfect marriage between all of us yeah. so that we do take care of these brothers and sisters. I told the people, and I'll end with this, Allah said in the Quran, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِئُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ إِلَّا مِؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَىٰ O Muhammad, you're going to grieve yourself to death because these people won't believe, right? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the first Muslim in his family. He was the first believer. He struggled with being rejected. He struggled with being persecuted. He struggled with having people believe in Islam, making fun of him, calling him names, throwing entrails of the inside of animals on him while he was in Salah. And he, he was going through this emotional state because he wanted Iman for the people. So I usually tell the Muslim community, you forgot what that is. Why? Because you got generations of Muslims in your family, your uncles and your aunties and your grandmother, your great grandmother, great grandfather, 100 years, 200 years. Islam has been in your family. So you forgot the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu But we can't forget because we go through that every single day. My grandmother's died not being Muslim. My grandfather's died not being Muslim. My aunties ain't Muslim. My uncles ain't Muslim. I ain't calling people and saying, Salaamu Alaikum. I'm not saying Eid al-Mubarak to my family. You know what I'm saying? We're not celebrating these things together. You know what I mean? So we wake up emotional every single day knowing that we got to do this work, right? So I remind the Muslim community, we got to first get busy in terms of da'wah to make sure we're bringing people to Islam, inshallah ta'ala, giving them that clear message. But and then that when they come into Islam, that you be like the Prophet Sallallahu was, that the people used to love to be around him. Right. They all they all thought that you know, I'm the best friend of the Prophet Sallallahu Right. He loves me the most yeah. because of the way he treated them. Right. Mashallah. And then we have to play that part. The community has to play that part with the new Muslim. That new Muslim is a gem. Right. It's better than the gold you got sitting in your house and the money you got in your bank account and the IRAs and all of these different things. Your trust funds is better than all of that. You take care of these brothers and sisters, mashallah. That is, mashallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, reward upon reward. I tell people, just teach him fatiha, man. He's going to recite it 17 days, 70 times a day for the rest of his life. That reward is yours. You know what I'm saying? Look at the brothers who sponsored 50, you know, the 16 reverse to go on Umrah. 100,000 in, in the, the Kaaba, 1,000 at the Prophet's Masjid, millions of barakah and salat that come back just from an eight-day trip on your scale because, mashallah, you helped this person, right? So we really got to focus on that, inshallah ta'ala, return back to that work, inshallah ta'ala. And this is, we, we say it all the time that, alhamdulillah, we hope that Reverts Reconnect is the Darul Arqam of our time.
Sure. Right. That that's that. This is the house, mashallah, where the where the reavers can come to and find that love, find that nurturing, find that education, so that mashallah they connect back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and if the community embraces them, alhamdulillah, just like the brother who gave me shahada, Abdul Aziz, subhanallah, back in 1998, I hadn't seen that brother 24 years, lost contact. After he gave me shahada, I knew that he knew, look, he wasn't in the right state of mind. He just came home from Rikers, let's keep it real. He back around his people. He got to figure out how to get his life together, right? So it was a lot to put on, alhamdulillah, and we didn't have that expectation from him, alhamdulillah. So we lost contact, and subhanallah, just two months ago, because I did a podcast like this, a brother in Connecticut knows him. And was like, yo, man, it's this brother, man. He keeps talking about he was in Zulu, and that he got shahada by Abdul Aziz. So he was like, you know, you know this cat? <laughs> He was like, I gave that brother shahada. MashaAllah. And subhanAllah, he sent me a message through Facebook. This is Abdul Aziz, man. Salaam alaikum. You remember me? Like, I've been looking for you this whole time. Where you been at, man? SubhanAllah. And we linked up, man, at the conference, you know, a couple of weeks back, man. MashaAllah. And it was just good to see him. And SubhanAllah, he was like, I was amazed to see that not only you still Muslim, but that you're an imam now. And that you're leading in the community and that you're doing so much good work with the Muslims, with the new Muslims. And he was like, Wallahi, he says, and Allah knows best, he says, I believe it's because of what you do that Allah has kept me steadfast in my deen, especially during those hard times when I was falling off. SubhanAllah. So you never know where that barakah is going to come from, man, just from, and I'm nobody. Right? I'm not saying that because I'm somebody, I'm nobody. Wallahi, I'm, I'm just saying, man, that when we invest in people, that's what the Prophet said, that he invested in people. And when you invest in those individuals, especially the new Muslims and the reverts, whether they took shahada years ago and they're still just trying to reintegrate and find themselves, when you invest in those people, that is better than gold, man. And this is what the community needs to get involved in, inshallah. Ta'ala. Inshallah. May Allah continue to put barakah in, in the program. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. What's your favorite thing about Allah? So Alhamdulillah, man, my favorite thing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is His mercy, man. That when you read throughout the Quran and you see how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those of us who are not deserving of it, man. And Allah says, you know, when you trip up and you mess up and you sin and you fall apart, He says, but if you repent and you mend your ways and you turn to me, you're gonna find me all forgiving, most merciful, right? SubhanAllah. So between the forgiveness and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I find that, you know, SubhanAllah, this is kind of like the realm I live in, man, you know? And this is the realm I, I try to have people live in, man, because, you know, especially nowadays, people are, they, they're hopeless. You know what I mean? People are just like, you know, where do I go to? I'm unhappy, you know what I mean? I'm struggling. Uh, there's so much mental illness going around, anxiety, all of these different things that subhanAllah, you know, if you just focus on, man, Allah don't want to punish you. Allah Allah wants to love you. Uh, you know what I mean? Allah doesn't want to put you in the hellfire. Allah wants to forgive you. You know what I mean? Allah wa ta'ala, He doesn't want to lead you astray. He's sending you everything in the world of signs so that you can, He can guide you. And all we got to do is just give in, man. What is one of your favorite hadith or verse in the Quran? So my favorite verse in the Quran is the verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ This verse, man, ever since I read this verse, I think uh, those who study with me, they probably tell you the Imam is always caught with this verse, man. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again. But Allah says, indeed, those who say our Lord is Allah, and then they remain steadfast, meaning they submit, they hold on to their faith, they hold on to their iman, as the hadith that goes along with it, قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ قُلْ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Say, my Lord is Allah, and then hold fast. Say, I believe in Allah, then hold fast. Allah says that for them is this special treatment that they're going to get, that the angels are going to descend upon them and say, don't fear and don't grieve. Don't fear and don't grieve, right? SubhanAllah. And they're going to say, we were your protectors in the world, SubhanAllah, and we're your protectors today. We were your companions in the world and we're your companions today, right? SubhanAllah. But glad tidings of paradise before that verse. Glad tidings of paradise for that what you've done, you know, SubhanAllah. And the scholars, they say that the don't fear, don't grieve is in three critical moments. Death, 
right? Where the soul is going to clamp onto the body for the disbeliever, right? The Prophet Sallam describes being pulled like through wool. And for the believer, the angel shows up and says, La takhafu wa la ta'asanu. Right? I, I, I just, and I picture it as being like Habibi. You don't got nothing to worry about today. He says the second being resurrected, day of resurrection, the toughest moment in our life. Your parents are going to abandon you. Right? you know, we can't do nothing for you today. It's so on you. You alone today, right? You, your book, your issues. Day people are going to be covered in their sweat, right? SubhanAllah, the sun will be a mile away. The day where Allah is going to expose the hypocrites, right? SubhanAllah. And then when they cross the Sirat, sharper than a knife, thinner than a hair, has hooks grabbing and tossing people into the fire of hell, pitch black. The only thing that lights up is Iman. That's your light. Some Iman, some people's Iman, like the best of flashlights. Other people's Iman got dead batteries in it. Don't work. Other people's Iman fluttering, you know what I mean? On, off, angels show up, Habibi, we got you. We had you in the world and we got you today. Why? Because you said your Lord is Allah and you remained firm upon that and you held on to that. So Alhamdulillah, man, I try to live in that verse, man. Uh, why Why should people learn about Islam and consider becoming a Muslim? People are conflicted. They don't know who's God, what God expects from us. Is there a creator? They're not a creator. Am I going to be accountable to something or not? Is my existence just, I live here, when I die, this just stops happening. So I just, let me just enjoy as much of it as I can. There's no real purpose. Islam gives you purpose. It connects you back to the creator of the heavens and earth. It allows you to know that yes, something bigger than you, much bigger than you, greater than you, has created this world and everything in it. As he says in the Quran, just if you were to reflect on the signs that Allah has placed on the earth, stand out there and look at the clouds, how perfect they are. You know what I mean? They soak up and they drop water from them. And then that water comes down to the earth and it's dead and it rains and the crops grow. We eat that stuff. We live. And Allah says and inside of yourself, there are signs, your heart's pumping the blood throughout your body. All of this perfection that exists in creation, even though we get sick, yes, we get sick. But even the body repairs itself, right? SubhanAllah, sometimes doctors can't do what the body does for itself. But we know that that's the process of life. You got to live, you get older, and then you pass away. But that through this process, man, you begin to find purpose in life. You begin to find that life is actually a gift for you to take advantage of. And that within this gift that Allah gave you to take advantage of, He's made it so that you can have or earn a much better place. That He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart of any human being can ever imagine. And, and this is what Allah is offering to everybody. You know what I mean? And when you read the Quran, you're going to see that it's undeniable that this book is from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. Scientifically, just one side, you're going to see it's undeniable. You know what I mean? And when you allow yourself to come to it with an open mind, you will always pour something positive in. It's the ones who come in closed-minded that don't get the benefit from it. But when you come in with an open mind and you allow it to transform you as you read it, Wallahi, I haven't seen a person who dives in like this, except that eventually they take that step and they become Muslim and then they're on this transform transformative journey. If you could ask Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam any question, what would it be? Any, can I hang out with you, man? I just want to hang out with him, man. You read about who he was and how he was, you know, SubhanAllah. I did a talk just recently uh, and said, you know, people got heroes, he's mine. He's my hero, man. When you look at the care he had for the world and the care he had for people and the love he had and how he distributed it, man, subhanAllah, is just, and how people wanted to be in his company, subhanAllah, all of the time. Oh, Allah, allow me to be from those who drink from the howl of the Prophet and get to hang out with the Prophet. Because I, I got the same concern the companion had, right? He came to the Prophet, he said, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you're going to be on a high rank with the MBI and the Rasul, Shuhada, you're going to be with the Prophets and the Martyrs, and you, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it up there. And then the Prophet, said, he said, you know, right, you will be my men, I have you'll be with the one whom you love. I can only hope that Allah allows me to love him like that, that I can just, you know, can just let me chill with you, man. <laughs> I just want to hang out with you, chill with you. How they lie and be by your side, man. How they lie, man. This is the scenario. It's the day of judgment. What would you hope your meeting with Allah would be like? It's the day of judgment. I'm standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, I, 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 I only would hope that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will smile down upon me and that he would allow me to receive my book in my right hand and that he would tell me, you've done good. You've done what I've asked. You've submitted yourself, even though you've fallen short of the mark, alhamdulillah, many times I've forgiven you. Alhamdulillah, I have mercy on you and I'm gonna enter you into paradise to enjoy you and your family and those whom you loved and you have no worries whatsoever. You know, that that's my hope that when I meet Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala, that would be the meeting, wallahi, and that it won't be anything other than that. And then that he allows me to be with those whom I love and that hopefully that when we enter paradise that inshallah ta'ala is not just the immediate family that I know, but that I'll see tribes that come from my lineage because of the effort and the work that we put forward, alhamdulillah, in trying to establish this deen, especially for our families, that it lived on and it grew, alhamdulillah, and became something beautiful that I was never able to see and experience. But I get to meet all of those beautiful Muslims, mashallah, family members that came after me, and that Allah accepts all of that work from us, inshallah. May Allah make it so for all of us and our families. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Till the next time, Jazakallah Khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.